Hello everyone, welcome back to the latest lecture session. So uh, let's dig right in. In the last couple of sessions, we have been uh, looking at uh, what are the issues facing the typical Indian citizen, right, uh, when they drink typical Indian waters, let's say, right. And I guess we looked at, uh, what is this now, uh, top cause of deaths. And we saw that waterborne diseases are one of the major cause of deaths for uh, infants and uh, children up to five years old, right. And I think it was 20% or 30%, but again, it was considerably high. So let's move on. So what do I have here? So typical impurities in water, right? If we look at every case under the sun, everything is possible, but we are looking at the typical impurities in uh, water. So typically we have physical, chemical and biological impurities, right? Physical, chemical and I guess biochemical instability and microbiological impurities, right? That's what I was trying to hint at. So physical, chemical, and microbiological impurities, right? With respect to physical, right, what are we typically talking about? Suspended solids, right, which will act as bodies for pathogens to thrive upon and we measure suspended solids by turbidity and total dissolved solids, right? Dissolved solids, obviously, that is the key. Again, you can look at conductivity and obviously other indicators with respect to uh, what do we say quality of water or color, temperature, taste and odor, but difficult to or at least difficult to define here I guess. Chemical, typical impurities in water, sulphates, chlorides, fluorides, phosphates, nitrates and nitrites and then some cations. Again, you know, we are only talking about uh, typical impurities. Hardness, yes, because this can lead to issues with issues with your drinking water supply and also it can cause indigestion, right? It can lead to gastroenteric troubles, right? Hardness, so that is something you need to be concerned about. We will look at this in greater detail, but again, what are we typically concerned about? Physical, chemical and microbiological. When we say microbiological, obviously, we are talking about the pathogens, right? And biochemical instability, we talked about BOD, biochemical oxygen demand, chemical oxygen demand, and it is typically caused by the presence of organic matter, which is usually measured by TOC or BOD and COD, let us say. Right, again heavy metals, we will look at this in greater detail later on. So, I am going to move through here. So, water quality standards, let us say if you want to know what are the drinking water quality standards. So, I believe I have that out here. So, let us look at these uh, water quality standards, the relevant uh, document, right. So, here we have it. Uh, what is that? Indian standard for drinking water, right, IS uh, 10500 and 2012, right, and Bureau of Indian Standards if I am not wrong, yes. And uh, what do we have out here? So, just when we look at the foreword though, right, uh, what do we have here? I have some aspects that I wanted to highlight, okay. As per the 11th five-year plan, you know, 2007 to 2012, uh, you know, we have around 2.17 lakh, uh, what do we say, habitations, right, or households, 2.17 lakh households, let us say, in the country that are affected by what is it now? Excess iron, fluoride, salinity, nitrate and arsenic in that order, right? So, what are the major, uh, what do we say, water quality issues? Excess iron, fluoride, salinity, nitrate, arsenic in that order. And also as I guess we discussed earlier too, approximately 10 million cases of diarrhea or more than 7 and more than 7.2 lakh typhoid cases, 1.5 lakh viral hepatitis occur every year. And you know what is the reason I guess, what is the cause? It is unclean water supply and poor sanitation, right? So these are easily, what do we say, uh, remedied uh, hurdles if I may say so or those hurdles that can be relatively easily tackled at least technically, right? Obviously cost wise that might be another issue here, let us say, right? So uh, let us move on. So again, general aspects, so as we see here, bacteriological requirements and also and so forth. So again, uh, what do we have here? We have organoleptic and physical parameters as we discuss color odor, pH and so on and so forth. pH 6.5 to 8.5, that is typical uh, value and turbidity is 1, turbidity measure of total suspended solids, dissolved solids 500 milligram per liter. We will come back to this, right? I want to discuss this in greater detail later. And then, you know, in greater detail, I guess we have, what do we say? Uh, standards for or requirement limit and sometimes permissible limit for, you know, specific, uh, what do we say, compounds, let us say, right? Aluminium, ammonia, 
barium, boron, calcium and so on and so forth, right? You have an exhaustive list. And how do you, you know, how do people prepare these standards? Let's say here, I guess they looked at standards or references from other countries and WHO and obviously about what can be achieved in India in the first case, right? You can't set unachievable targets. But in general, scientifically, how do you, you know, go about, you know, getting these standards now, right? For example, I have a compound. How do I know the quantity that's deemed safe, right? So you have what we say uh, tests there that can be conducted where you can uh, look at the effects of toxicity or carcinogenicity. So you are going to measure, let's say, typically on first uh, lab rats or mice first and then on humans, let's say. You are going to measure, you know, the concentration at which adverse effects are going to be seen, the maximum, what do we say, concentration at which adverse effects are going to be seen. And then from that particular value, you can calculate the uh, maximum, what do we say, or the safe dose, if I may say so, right? We will probably look at that later. So that's how people typically come up with or calculate these safe doses. Obviously, it's going to be dependent upon body weight and so on and so forth. So you are going to have standards for children and infants, different standards for adults. But again, that is the case when we go about it in or look at it in greater detail. So here we have uh, the table three, I guess, uh, parameters concerning toxic substances, typically toxic substances where I guess the concentration limits are pretty low. Here we have three ppb or three parts per billion. And here we are typically talking about, I guess, 45 milligrams per liter and so on and so forth out here, right? Okay, so let's uh, move on. And then radioactive substances, but rarely do we come across this in uh, ground waters. And then based on Indian scenario and the experiences in the Indian context, we have limits for pesticide residues, right? You have atrazine here, right, endosulfan and such. Again, typical uh, pesticides. Uh, which are used in India, let's say, right? Some of which have been banned, if I'm not wrong. And then, obviously, bacteriological quality of drinking water. So, this is the thing that we are relatively more concerned about, right? Because you have acute and severe effects. And as we talked about it earlier, you know, sanitation and obviously, what do we sit now? Disinfection are uh, relevant uh, ways to look at. And here we have bacteriological quality, let's say, right? Again, leading to diarrhea and so on and so forth. So, we won't measure for the specific type of pathogen, but we look at indicators, let's see. Here we have, let's say, different usages, all water intended for drinking. We measure E. coli or dermato or, let's say, coliform bacteria, E. coli or coliform bacteria. Again, they are indicators, let's see. So, again, if this is relatively important, let's look at this. Although E. coli is the more precise indicator of fecal pollution, fecal pollution meaning if human or animal feces, let's say, uh, is getting uh, what do we say or is polluting the water body. So, a way to uh, what do we say, an indirect way to figure out or figure that out is by measuring the E. coli or as I mentioned, fecal coliform, I guess, right. Again, what do we have here? E. coli is the more precise indicator of fecal pollution. The count of dermotolerant coliform bacteria is an acceptable alternative, right? Total coliform bacteria are not acceptable indicators of sanitary quality of rural water supplies, particularly in tropical areas where many bacteria of sa no sanitary significance occur in almost all untreated supplies. So, that's something to keep in mind. As in, we have fecal coliform and also uh, total coliform, right? So, as uh, uh, they are saying, typically for Indian uh, context or in the Indian context, total coliform is not a good idea. Fecal coliform, they are indicators of what do we say, contamination by what do we say, pathogens or bacteria that exist in the human gut, let's say, contamination of the water body, let's say. But when we talk about total coliform, you know, you know, uh, what do we say, life is mostly what do we say, bacteria, let's say, right? And uh, when we talk about total coliform, you can have other, what do we say, bacteria that come into role or not role, pardon me, come into play, but do not, uh, you know, cause any adverse human health effects, right? So that's not uh, good enough. That's what they are uh, uh, saying out here, right? And again, it is recognized that in the great majority of rural water supplies in developing countries, fecal contamination is widespread. Under these conditions, right, we should set medium term targets for progressive improvement in water supplies, right? That's the aspect, medium term targets and again, progressive improvement. Again, so let's go back to this E. coli and uh, fecal coliform, let's say, 
and how do we measure that let us say we count it in terms of colony forming units per, right say and the requirement is that there should be none in any 100 ml sample and treated water entering the distribution system. So, here you have what is it now uh, the what is it E coli or the fecal coliform and total coliform also again for both it has to be 0. Treated water in the distribu distribution system again same case you know uh, 0 I guess right. But with respect to drinking we are only going to look at coliform uh, or you know fecal coliform and E coli right. So, that is something to keep in mind right. I think that is what I wanted to look at but let me just uh, okay here we have different ways and so on and so forth. I think I just came across that PCR based method right the one that is also used for polymerized chain reaction or PCR method right. This is another uh, way to look at what do we say DNA and RNA I guess and again that is the method that is used for your uh, detection of corona too right. Again let us skip that. So, we have different water quality standards right and let us move on. So, one aspect is that you know 2.17 lakh habitations are affected right and more than half are accept, uh, what do we say are affected by iron uh, high levels of iron fluorides salinity nitrate and arsenic. So, let us look at you know what are these uh, you know what is the issue and obviously we looked at this in great detail. So, with respect to fluoride of fluoride in ground water right or one aspect because I guess I directly went to fluoride here first and foremost we have iron here right and iron you know typically benign but again you know any compound above its relevant limit or standard or permissible standard or safe dose pardon me is going to have some level of adverse uh, what do we say effects let us say. So, iron let us say for example, here you have Haridwar, Badrabad and uh, so on the industrial zones. So, after setting up of these industrial zones the villagers or villagers yeah villagers downstream let us say have been complaining about uh, what is it now water being relatively of poorer quality let us say. And typically we saw that you know you have relatively high concentrations of Fe 2 plus let us say not Fe uh, 3 plus, but Fe 2 plus. Well, this is not uncommon again you know and that could mean that some industrial waste are being uh, mixed up here or there are other uh, geochemical parameters that are being affected by industrial activity that are leading to release of uh, Fe 2 plus right. So, that is one thing to keep in mind. So, too much Fe 2 plus it can cause considerable issues with your uh, digestive uh, system right. So, again people are uh, concerned about it, but again it is not toxic toxic in the sense that you know we would not uh, die per se uh, within a short period of time. Well, that is the aspect that we are discussing here. So, again iron that is something to be concerned about right. Again next is fluoride I guess and what do we see uh, locations certainly over Rajasthan right. Rajasthan and then southern parts of India, Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh and Telangana and along Orissa I guess. We have different clusters and where are we? I think we are somewhere out here right, we are somewhere out here right. So, again fluorides why am I concerned with fluorides now? Well, again the map I guess is here why am I concerned with fluorides? Firstly keep in mind that the acceptable limit uh, is 1.5 milligram per liter or 1 milligram per liter and permissible limit as in if there is no other alternative source of water available then the permissible limit is 1.5 milligrams per liter right. So, here the issue is that you are going to have or you know cons of what we say relatively higher concentrations of fluoride is going to lead to formation of or lead to fluorosis. Again certainly in Andhra Pradesh I heard this a lot I think in regions of Nellore and such or the districts pardon me. And what happens here fluoride you know it is incorporated into the bone hydroxy appetite, appetite I guess you know uh, phosphates let us say right. Calcium appetite is typically what we have in bone and here you are going to have formation of uh, fluoride appetites let us say right. And what is that going to lead to obviously it is change in size and structure of the uh, crystal that is obvious. And the fluoro appetite decreases the mechanical competence of the bone right as in it is going to be relatively brittle the bones you know break easily resulting in abnormal structure right abnormal structures as you can see out here. Poor quality of the bone with increased risk of fractures again because it is brittle now relatively brittle now. And we are not talking about you know very high concentrations again keep in mind that this is remarkably widespread and also keep in mind that the acceptable limit is 1 milligram per liter right. 
and what, what concentrations are these adverse effect uh, what do we say pronounced? It is not very high, it is just at 4 milligram per liter, right. Skeletal fluorosis of the types genu, valgum, genuvarum, flexion and rotational, right. So, different kinds out here we are not going to do, go into that in detail. Again at 3.6, but this is in the uh, with respect to the what do we say teenagers or you know children. Again obviously greater adverse effects let us say wind swept right this is called wind swept in patients let us say right wind swept. Again you know you can see how the growth is affected and you know once your bone structure is affected let us say the strength of your uh, bone is affected carrying out ro what do we say routine tasks is almost impossible and you know remarkably wide sections of uh, what do we say the Indian uh, population right are affected by uh, fluorosis. So, that is something to uh, keep in mind. We will look at how to remove possibly and such later on right. But one aspect is you know at least in the US I know that they add uh, fluoride right at low levels again that is a contentious issue. But why is that because at very low levels though again you are going to have teeth issues. So, some fluoride is good for teeth, but at uh, you know low levels obviously why is it beneficial? It reduces dental cavities or caries and stabilizes the skeletal system, but that is at low levels. But at high levels you know with respect to 2 ppm or 2 ppm is ppm is parts per million milligram per liter you have effects of what do we say dental fluorosis right very mild mild moderate and severe right that is what we have. And then around 4 ppm or greater than 4 ppm you have skeletal fluorosis right and tooth mineralization greater than 1.5. So, let us skip that and here is one other aspect that was highlighted earlier when we uh, looked at the uh, Bureau of Indian standards for drinking water quality. We had uh, what do we say high salinity distribution of electrical conductivity in India we are talking about ground water here right. Electrical conductivity it will give you an idea about total dissolved solids right total dissolved solids. So, where do we see obviously in this particular uh, region let us say Rajasthan yes and some parts of uh, Gujarat and these days we see that along the uh, eastern coast right uh, Tamil Nadu Andhra Pradesh right. And why is this at least this here I guess you would expect it where water is scarce and depending upon the type of deposit subsurface deposits let us say. But here you know where we have Krishna, Godavari and so on and so forth out here and Kaveri right. Why are we slowly but surely what do we say observing greater uh, what do we say concentrations of uh, TDS or greater electrical conductivity and why is that an issue now? why is that an issue or why are we concerned about it right. So, the reason is that here due to lack of a perennial source of a reliable source of water right. You have the farmers extracting ground water right. We are talking about uh, lack of uh, rainfall uh, which is reliable let us say right. Just having a ton of water one day and no water for the other uh, 29 days of the month is not going to solve the purpose right. And with uh, global warming and such these severe conditions are relatively more pronounced. So, obviously what do the farmers uh, the poor farmers need to do they are extracting more and more uh, ground water. So, what is going to happen the saline water from the oceans is ingressing into the ground water right. And so, that is one reason why we see greater electrical conductivity or greater salinity and greater obviously tedious to total dissolved solids. And why is this an issue right because you know once the uh, soil also you know adsorbs these uh, salts and such its uh, productivity is going to decrease exponentially now right. So, indicative again uh, let me see what else I have indicative of high TDS right. And here we have distribution of chloride again obviously it is going to mirror what uh, the other or previous figure we looked at Rajasthan and Gujarat. And as I mentioned the coast right again one reason certainly at least for these high patches let us say or con patches of high concentration is over extraction of uh, uh, ground water right. So, again uh, let us move on I guess we discussed this crop productivity in very fertile lands here these are the rice bowls of India right. So, here uh, this is a what a typical uh, what do we say 
salinity affected soil looks like and there are very few very as in one or two crops that can survive and those crops typically are not native to India nor do we really consume those uh, what do we say the products of those crops now right. So that is a huge issue and other aspect is locations of nitrate as we uh, looked at earlier iron, uh, fluoride, TDS or salinity right and then nitrate let us say are uh, the major issues and then I guess we had arsenic right arsenic again we are now looking at nitrate. So, again here we are talking about nitrate greater than uh, 45 milligrams per liter milligram is parts per million milligram per liter is parts per million. So, you see that it is pretty widespread and what is the issue now or what can it lead to right here ok I guess first I wanted to look at the source. So, sources I guess obviously fertilizers right you know urea you need to add source of nitrogen or ammonia and after oxidation and such you are going to have it uh, what is it now permeate to the ground water typically soil can hold on to cations but not hold on to anions. So, NH4 plus yes soil can hold on to uh, what this cations due to its cation exchange capacity. But anions they go through typically let us say whenever there is percolation of uh, ground water or surface water to the ground water right. So, that is how fertilizer and manure again you know manure as in you have uh, what is it now the uh, composted uh, or typically composted or sometimes not composted uh, feces of uh, animals applied in lands for their uh, uh, what do we say to increase the productivity of the soils. But obviously one uh, what do we say side effect adverse effect is that it leads to what do we say nitrate high nitrate concentrations or pollution of the ground water by nitrate. Obviously, if wastes from animals are an issue obviously waste from humans are also an issue. So, septic systems and such if they are not well designed and decaying organic matter or natural organic matter too I guess yes natural organic matter you know leaves and so on and so forth. And let me see what else I have. So, livestock menu runoff that is something we discussed, septic tanks, industrial waste, lack of proper underground drainage and sewerage systems right. So, again you know nitrogen in the atmosphere, denitrifying bacteria right they have what is it I guess nitrates that can be taken up by some plants. Again this is the cycle but we are not going to go through that but again as the issue here is that we add fertilizers let us say when this is typically not feasible right and these uh, what do we say nitrites and nitrates lead to groundwater uh, pollution let us see. And the other aspect is the septic tanks leaking septic tanks most of the uh, household uh, wastewater treatment is by you know septic tanks and anaerobic process and most are poorly designed and constructed and you have them leaking perennially into the groundwater right and that is going to lead to uh, nitrate contamination. And typically they can lead to death of infants how? We have you know them causing what is called a blue baby syndrome and why is that because it can affect it is a fatal blood disorder and typically affects uh, infants under 6 months of age methemoglobinemia and it affects the oxygen carrying capacity where is that ok it adversely affects the oxygen carrying capacity of blood. So, which can cause shortness of breath and thus you know the skin looks blue and it can sometimes lead to infant death and I think we have a picture ok. Well, again this is why we call this uh, blue baby syndrome you know it affects or adversely affects the oxygen carrying capacity of uh, blood and especially with respect to the infants let us say whose systems are still developing right. And then lastly we are talking about arsenic in this uh, context. So, I guess with respect to arsenic I see that I am uh, out of time. So, we will uh, continue this in the next class and uh, thank you for today.